All right, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, the PGY2 class, we're presenting the afferent anatomy, and then we're also going to go over some relevant uh, clinical diseases, kind of a brief overview, um, a little touch on a little bit of what's in the BCSC, and um, I think uh, some of the others have brought in some other information as well. Um, Tina is going to join us uh, as soon as she can get here. <laughs> She's uh, taking care of a procedure this morning. Um, so I'll start out with uh, the uh, visual pathway here. Um, and this just is uh, the brief overview that you can get, um, you know, kind of looking at everything that's involved in the afferent system it includes everything from the very front uh, of the eye from the cornea through the eyeball to the retina to the optic nerve through the optic chiasm tract and into the brain and into the visual cortex and the occipital lobe. So all of these pieces can, are susceptible to damage and susceptible to injury and can cause uh, different types of disease states that we worry about. Uh, as far as the retina goes, um, the, uh, uh, here's your overall view of the posterior pole here. This is your fovea, this is your macula, optic nerve. We all take a look at this every day. <coughs> the things to keep in mind here, and these are kind of points that are emphasized in the BCSC that will be important for OCAPs, are just these, you know, kind of nuanced measurements that you sort of need to memorize. Um, the, uh, the optic disc, uh, where it's located, creates a physiologic blind spot that's about 17 degrees from the fovea. And the size of that blind spot is about, if you roughly remember five degrees, that will be a close enough approximation. It's actually a little bit larger in the vertical plane than in the horizontal plane, and that's just due to the um, different uh, shape of the optic nerve in the vertical plane. Uh, the fovea itself um, normally measures about a disc diameter, um, which is about 1.5 millimeters, and it's located four millimeters temporal and 0.8 millimeters inferior to the optic disc. So you can see it's not exactly horizontal straight across, and that's another good uh, point to remember. Uh, as far as the um, orientation of the nerve fiber layer within the retina, uh, you can see that there's uh, radiations here, and um, that's important to keep in mind uh, that these uh, cells that are coming in temporally here um, pass through this horizontal raphe, and they're going to um, course over uh, the macula. And so um, when you have injury to uh, particular areas of the, um, these vessels that are feeding these, uh, these areas, it kind of, you're able to correspond the, um, the visual deficits to where those nerve fiber layers are injured. Um, and then the other thing to keep in mind is that as you get uh, more nasally here, um, you're going to have these fibers coming in really steep angle, and that will cause some of these bow tie configurations, which uh, some of the other presenters are going to go over a little bit later. As far as the uh, really uh, super high level, super low level detail of the cellular organization, I'm not going to go over everything today. Dr. Mamlis is going to touch on a lot of this in his lectures. But the important thing to remember is that light pathway actually comes, uh, the retina is sort of flipped upside down. So the um, photoreceptor cells are actually the furthest away from the light pathway as it comes in. There are a few of these uh, ganglion cells that are located uh, right here in the ganglion cell layer that actually do have some light sensing uh, capability. And these are called these uh, internally uh, photosensitive uh, ganglion cells here. And then the light signal passes all the way through here and uh, gets processed in the outer segments of the photoreceptors. There's also a number of other cells in this uh, section that are important to know about. Um, so uh, bipolar cells are important in, transmit, in vertical transmission of information. Um, these uh, other cells here, we have amacrine cells. There are some interplexiform cells that aren't labeled here. And then we also have um, the uh, why did I forget? Horizontal cells. <laughs> the horizontal cells that stretch across. And those are actually important in signaling between photoreceptors and between ganglion cells, which is important in distinction of contrast um, and also in determining spatial location of, uh, of these light signals that we're getting. Uh, and then uh, the last sort of anatomical point that I want to point out here is that um, in the 
center of the retina, right in the fovea, um, there's uh, almost a one-to-one -one ratio, and generally is a one-to-one -one ratio of the photoreceptors to the ganglion cells. And that's uh, important because you want to have your highest sensitivity of uh, picking up those visual signals in that area. In the periphery, um, when you get further out, the ratio really expands and it gets out to about one to a thousand. So you see this one ganglion cell here, and this is just a, obviously a cartoon demonstration, but one ganglion cell is supplying you know, hundreds and thousands of photoreceptors, which is important for um, uh, processing information and being able to synthesize and say, okay, I know that there's an object coming from this way. That's the important piece of information that I need from that signal. Then I can turn and look at it and see the object and make out more details. Um, I'm not going to go over any of these in any great detail, but um, the uh, BCSC presents a couple of examples. Basically, any type of retinopathy is a problem affecting the afferent pathway of the visual system um, in terms of the retina. Um, a couple of these, you know, sort of important points to know um, I've kind of highlighted here. Uh, vitamin A deficiency uh, is one that we probably don't think of all that often. Um, but it's one that can cause uh, problems with the photoreceptor signaling. And um, the key finding here is that if you were to do an ERG on somebody who's low in vitamin A, you would see rod dysfunction. Um, and then a couple other things. We always uh, are screening patients who are taking Plaquenil um, for lupus and various other rheumatologic diseases. Um, so uh, the important thing to know is that that risk of, of damage, that bullseye maculopathy that we see with Plaquenil um, is increased risk with uh, um, duration of treatment greater than five years and then also with a cumulative dose once it exceeds 1,000 grams. Um, and typically the recommendations are to screen one year into treatment, uh, you know, any time during that year, and then annually um, once patients have been undergoing five years of treatment. So you don't have to screen ev patients every year when they're on Plaquenil. Um, and then there are also some perineoplastic syndromes that are associated. So the last point I want to make about the retina is that um, when you have a patient with decreased vision and you're trying to sort of parse out whether this is an optic nerve or a retinal problem, these are just a couple of things that you can consider. They're both going to have vision changes. So that's, you know, common to both pathways. But in terms of the other things that you can look at, color vision is going to be slightly different between the two. Typically with retinopathy, the amount of color vision loss, if there is any, it parallels the degree of visual acuity loss. Whereas if there are, if there's optic neuropathy, there tends to be a more dramatic change in color vision. So that's a really quick and easy test. You can do it at the bedside. If you're doing a consult, bring your eye handbook and just go through those color plates. And even the basic, most simple test is grab your, um, your uh, phenylephrine and hold the cap up and, you know, just test uh, contra uh, color sensitivity between the two eyes. Um, secondly, I want to point out that uh, meta metamorphopsias and photopsias are much more common in retinopathy, and particularly photopsia usually indicates a problem in the outer segments of the retina. You're rare to have a, uh, an afferent pupillary defect with a retinal problem, whereas you're more commonly going to have one if there's an optic neuropathy. And then lastly, um, this is, and this is kind of a subtle distinction because there are some conditions uh, where you will have scotoma in the retinopathy, um, but typically um, there's more distortion of the lines in the Amsler grid with retinopathy as compared to just chunks missing when there's an optic neuropathy. All right. All right, so picking up where Becca left off, the kind of next step in the afferent pathway would be the optic nerve. So this is basically the confluence of those axons of the ganglion cell layer. Um, Again, some numbers kind of picked out from BCSC that seem to be very testable um, on OCAPs. So a confluence of about 1 to 1.2 million ganglion cell axons, and then they exit through the lamina cribrosa, which contains approximately 200 to 300 channels. So that fact that this is a relatively small number of channels for a lot of axons. I'd just like to say, like, who gives a shit? I, I totally agree. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. stupid, but it's true. Yes, Absolutely. yeah. A lot of non-clinical information uh, that seems to be tested. We actually brought that up in our, as we were discussing preparing this lecture. But um, So the combination of that fact paired with kind of this unique blood supply, which I'll talk about in a second, 
is responsible for the particularly sensitivity or sensitivity of the optic nerve to all different types of damage. So whether it's ischemic, inflammatory, compressive, toxic, metabolic, uh, lots of different things. We've touched on a couple already, and we'll touch on a few more as we go through the lecture. Some of the measurements, um, so the, the diameter of the optic disc, it's approximately 1.5 millimeters at the optic disc and then about three millimeters after it acquires its myelin coating. Um, and then if you include the, or the optic nerve sheath, it's about six millimeters in diameter after that. Uh, so just posterior to the sclera, um, I kind of mentioned this, uh, the optic nerve acquires a dural sheath. Um, clinically relevant in this, in this point is that it's contiguous with uh, the periorbita of the optic canal and then the arachnoid membrane. So you do get this, this channel, the subarachnoid space that courses all the way up to the posterior globe um, and is contiguous with the rest of the uh, subarachnoid space of the cranium. So any elevation, as we've all known and have seen at this point most likely, uh, elevation in ICP can really be visualized quite well often um, in the posterior pole. I actually saw a guy in clinic yesterday that looked probably worse than this. Uh, and is going to get an optic nerve sheath fenestration today. Um, and then it's also just important to note that in the optic nerve, at least in the retrobulbar space, there is an approximate retinal topographic representation that's maintained, um, but later we'll kind of see that that can get rotated and changed. As far as the blood supply, um, so the optic disc and then the bulbar optic nerve before it actually leaves the sclera, receives a blood supply largely from the branches of the posterior ciliary um, arteries. And I've seen in some places, actually doesn't mention this in BCSC, at least not in the uh, neuro section, but there's this um, uh, circle of Zinn Holler that uh, is mentioned in a few of the pictures that I looked up. But then the retro bulbar, the orbital optic nerve, receives a blood supply largely from small peel branches coming off of the ophthalmic artery not the central retinal artery itself. Um, the central retinal artery and vein travel uh, within the anterior 10 to 12 millimeters. So they actually travel underneath, um, but then they'll pierce that uh, optic nerve sheath at about 10 to 12 millimeters posterior to the globe. And then this, I don't really go into this, we'll probably talk about you know what's in the superior orbital fissure outside and all that stuff, but I wanted to bring this up because it, it did talk a little bit about the anatomy. So the optic nerve travels posteriorly through the optic canal, and within the optic canal we have the ophthalmic artery that uh, traverses the optic canal with, uh, with the optic nerve. And then it is separated from the superior orbital fissure by this optic strut, which terminates superiorly as the anterior clinoid. And that seems to be a landmark that's talked about not infrequently when we're reviewing uh, MRI and CT images. Um, and then the optic canal is 8 to 10 millimeters long, 5 to 7 millimeters in diameter, and it's anchored tightly within that canal, so that's why a lot of these traumatic injuries can cause some shearing uh, forces to the optic nerve and cause damage right within that canal. Next, uh, we talk about the optic chiasm, so it's the 8 to 12 millimeter intracranial portion of the optic nerve. Uh, or where it terminates, and then it measures about 12 millimeters wide, 8 millimeters long, and 4 millimeters thick. Located uh, anterior to the hypothalamus and third ventricle, and then its blood supply, uh, this comes up over and over again, uh, blood supply of the various portions of the uh, afferent system, is from small branches off the proximal anterior cerebral and anterior communicating arteries. As far as the location of the optic chiasm, um, relative to the, the cella, we talk about that most are just superior located, um, about 10 millimeters above the cella, but there are about 17% that are located anteriorly, or what we would call prefixed, and 4% that are located posteriorly. So here we're just talking, so this is normal where the optic nerve comes, the chiasm is just right above the cella and the pituitary, but then there's this prefixed um, orientation where it's just anterior and then postfix where it's posterior. On MRI, we can, I pulled up some pictures that you can kind of see this as well. So this is normal with the optic chiasm here, pituitary. And then we get an example of a prefix, a little more anterior, and then a postfix, postfix a little more posterior. Uh, 
Um, within the chiasm, uh, as, as we all know, there's crossing of fibers, so it's the nasal retina, and it's approximately 53% of those fibers cross the opposite side. Um, so a superior temporal visual field defect contralateral to a central scotoma is helpful in localizing a lesion to the junction of the optical nerve or, or optic nerve or a junctional scotoma. And I'll show a couple examples of visual field deficits like that on the next slide. And then also it mentions that um, macular fibers tend to cross posteriorly. Um, and so if you get a posterior lesion on the optic chiasm, then you can get this bitemporal scotomatous field defect. Here are a couple of examples. So a lateral chiasmal or junctional uh, lesion can cause this ipsilateral central scotoma. I, I couldn't find the best representation, but contralateral to a temporal hemianopia, and to some degree, a lot of the a lot of the visual field examples I brought up, you know, would be more of just a superior temporal de defect and then a central scotoma, um, but you could get this temporal hemianopia. If it was posterior central chiasm, then you because those macular fibers uh, cross posteriorly then a lot of times you'll get this bilateral homonymous temporal hemianopia, but this again can be in degrees, so it could be just more of a central uh, defect, um, but if it's a more extensive lesion, then it can grow to be a almost complete. Some of the common offenders, uh, and that we'll, you'll see, or at least we'll see as we rotate through neural clinic, are pituitary adenomas, paracellar uh, meningiomas, craniopharyngiomas, so on and so forth, but you also have to consider infectious inflammatory and then neoplastic or lymphoproliferative. Okay, our questions are numbered a little weird just because I was too lazy and didn't go change the numbers. But so these, I guess we can do them just as we go along if that's okay, it'll mix things up. So here's just a few questions based off what we talked about so far. Um, so if we're keeping track, you can just write down our honor system or whatever. So approximately how many ganglion cell axons contribute to the optic nerve? What's that? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Bonus points for that. Right. So, yeah. <laughs> and then true or false, the ratio of photoreceptor cells to ganglion cells is highest in the periphery and lowest of the fovea. And which cells participate in signal processing within the retinal layers? And that can be multiple answers. I can't remember if the next slide is, oh, I can see. Okay, this is the answer, so if everyone is ready. There's the answers. All right, I think that's sure about the second one? Yeah, I think it's true. Yeah, it's ratio. The, no, it's, so it, it depends on how you read it. So it's photoreceptors to ganglion. So you right. have more, so the ratio is, oh, yeah. I mixed that up. Yeah. Okay, it's true. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> yeah. It's true. You have less photoreceptors. So yeah, no, I was thinking ganglion. if it's a smaller <laughs> ratio, if it's one to 1,000, but I mixed up the, the wording when I wrote the question, <laughs> sorry. You guys got it, you get the point. <laughs> So it's interesting how the um, optic tra from the the fibers um, from the retina rotate about 90 degrees as they travel through the optic tracts and through the lateral geniculate nucleus. So this is a picture like a cross section of the lateral geniculate nucleus. And as those fibers come through, the upper retinal fibers actually rotate 90 degrees to lie immediately in the LGN, and the lower retinal fibers uh, rotate to lie laterally. And in the center, um, it's called the hilum. We have the macular fibers. And the way I remember this, just lower is lateral. Um, lateral retinal fibers. And the optic tracts themselves, they um, proceed circumferentially around the hypothalamus, uh, and right before they hit the lateral geniculate nucleus, the uh, pupillary pathway fibers uh, branch off and they go to the pretectal uh, nucleus here. Um, so the pupillary pathway is separate. Uh, these fibers actually correspond to non-visual retinal ganglion cells, SL axons, um, that are in the retina itself. Um, and then there are also, there's another offshoot of fibers that uh, project onto the suprachiasmatic nucleus itself uh, to regulate our diurnal cycles too. So the LGN, it's shaped like a mushroom. It's located um, 
in the posterior thalamus, on the uh, lateral to the midbrain, um, and it has a dual blood supply. So from the internal carotid artery, um, the anterior choroidal artery corresponds to the blood supply to the macular region. Um, and the uh, posterior cerebral artery has an offshoot, the posterior lateral choroidal artery, um, that corresponds to the blood supply in the medial and lateral aspects of the LGN, which I'll, you'll see a picture of that soon. And the LGN itself is divided, the gray matter is divided into six layers that are tested, again. So going from inferior to superior, the inferior uh, levels um, are the M cell fibers or the magnocellular fibers um, that have uh, axons from the retina itself again. Um, and these are responsible for motion detection and it's the larger receptive field. The four superior layers are the P cell axons or parvocellular and these um, have to do with spatial resolution and color perception. These are my mnemonics, so M for motion and then P for pretty colors. Um, and in between those layers, you have uh, the K cell neurons, or axons. Um, they're, these are still under investigation. We don't know exactly what they're responsible for, but we know they're somewhat responsible for color vision as well. And also, if you notice, the, one other way to memorize this is uh, going from inferior to superior. You have, it goes in alphabetical order, M to P. And then sometimes these layers are tested as well. So layers one, four, and six receive axons from the contralateral eye here and two, three, and five receive axons from the ipsilateral eye. So as you can see, um, each, uh, each eye has a magnocellular layer and two um, parvocellular layers that correspond to it. And I don't know if this will be useful, but my mnemonic I came up with, again, for this is that the ipsilateral size has all prime numbers that are in a row. So two, three, and five. Not like one, three, and five, but always two, three, and five. So, um, uh, Going further back, so these, um, the axons that originate from the retinal ganglion cells they actually terminate in the LGN. And then you have the second order neurons that, gang that arise from these ganglion cells. Um, so lesions in, uh, beyond the LGN in the, op in the optic radiations and beyond actually um, have normal pupillary light reflexes because we saw how the light pathway um, comes off, in, uh, off of the um, fibers before the LGN is, um, is hit. And uh, you don't, actually don't see optic atrophy because these second order neurons are the ones that are affected. Um, and it's also uh, interesting how the um, optic tract lesions and LGN lesions have their own type of uh, typical visual field defects. So we see that in all retrochiasmal lesions there are contralateral homonymous hemianopias. But um, in the optic tract and LGN lesions these are incongruous specifically. Um, so this is thought to be because the nerve fibers of the corresponding points in the retina, so for example, the left right upper quadrant, left eye right upper quadrant, and right eye right upper quadrant, because of the rotation of the fibers and the difference in the blood supply as well between the lower retinal, uh, upper retinal, and the macular fibers, um, we don't, the, the corresponding fibers don't lie exactly adjacent to one another. So if you have a, com a, a common lesion like a compressive, mass lesion or aneurysm that causes these um, type of defects, it can affect um, the fibers of one eye but not the other. Ischemic insults are less common, um, but I can show you here. This is the kind of defects that these ischemic uh, insults often form. These are uh, sector anopias and sector sparing uh, homonymous heminopias. So you can see here again the hilum, which corresponds to the macular region, is supplied by the um, posterior choroidal and that comes from the posterior cerebral. So you see this um, contralateral homonymous horizontal sector anopia. And um, the lower retinal fibers um, in the lateral region and the upper retinal fibers in the medial region um, are supplied by the anterior choroidal artery and they can form this sector sparing homonymous heminopia. So optic tract syndrome is a triad of typical findings that, we've, that we see in uh, patients who have optic tract lesions. So the th three things that we usually see are the incongruous contralateral homonymous heminopia. We actually see an RAPD on the contralateral eye. So um, this is because the majority of the optic tract is composed of fibers that have already decussated. So they're mostly nasal fibers. And so more of the contralateral eye fibers are hit than the ipsilateral eye and you see a contralateral RAPD. You also see a bilateral um, RNF, RNFL atrophy or optic atrophy in this sort of bow tie configuration you can make out here. It's subtle sometimes when you're examining patients, but it can be a clue as to where the lesion is. 
So why does that happen? Um, we actually saw this in a patient um, during uh, neurology, neurology rotation. Um, so uh, it's a little bit confusing, but if you look at this picture, it starts to make a little more, a little more sense. So you have the optic nerve here, and uh, this is the nasal area, nasal retina, um, uh, nasal to optic nerve, and then you have the macula, um, temporal to it. But then in the nasal half of the macula, the fibers enter right here, um, uh, right here at the optic nerve, and all the nasal fibers seem to enter in this bow tie configuration, and the temporal fibers enter superiorly and inferiorly. So with unilateral bow tie, uh, when you see that, it's usually because there's a contralateral um, optic track, optic track lesion, because the contralateral eye hasn't uh, corresponds to the nasal fibers. Um, and then the uh, in the bilateral bow tie atrophy, there's that that corresponds to chiasmatic lesions, um, because that's where the uh, nasal fibers decussate, so both eyes are hit. So um, this is a better visual description of what's going on there. So in the optic track lesion, you see the unilateral bow tie and you see the, sorry, unilateral bow tie with, on the contralateral side, and the um, ipsilateral side has a temporal uh, pallor to it. So you can see here in the optic uh, tracks, the nasal fibers from the contralateral eye make it over, and um, the uh, uh, temporal fibers from the ipsilateral eye travel this way. And you can see why there would be a configuration in that sense. And this is an example of a patient with an MS lesion in the optic tracks. So finally, the, the last section here for me, um, the optic radiations. So the um, second order neurons, they connect at the LGN and then project back to the occipital cortex. And here there is again a 90 degree rotation, but there's a correction of that 90 degree rotation. So the, um, uh, the uh, lower retinal fibers that were originally lateral are again lower, and the uh, medial retinal fibers are again, um, or the, the upper retinal fibers are again um, upper rather than being medial. So the inferior fibers, uh, they travel uh, a, a bit anteriorly here through Meyer's loop and then project posteriorly to the occipital uh, cortex here. And the superior retinal fibers um, in the parietal lobe, they uh, project just straight back instead of um, going anteriorly first. So you see the typical pie in the sky and pie in the floor lesions um, where you have the peripheral contralateral homonymous superior quadrantinopia in anterior temporal lobe uh, lesions, and you have the um, contralateral inferior homonymous quadrantinopia for the parietal lobe lesions. And sometimes we'll actually see that patients who have these lesions end up having almost like a homonymous uh, hemianopia, <laughs> but if you look closely, you can sometimes see that their defect is denser superiorly for temporal lobe lesions or denser inferiorly for parietal lobe lesions. And usually these lesions are caused by ischemic insults in the MCA territory. Sometimes we see these uh, compressive lesions as well, of course. All right, you guys ready for some more questions? The second set of questions. I'll just read through these. So, why do lesions in the optic radiation show no optic atrophy on exam? What type of visual field defects do patients with optic tract lesions have? Is it contralateral, is it ipsilateral, is it congruous, is it incongruous? And this third one, hopefully my mnemonic maybe helps somebody. Um, fibers from the right cell, parvocellular, um, right eye, sorry, right eye parvocellular ganglion cells will terminate in which level of the left LGN? So right eye, contralateral LGN, which level, which levels are affected? And this is just one of those test questions that come up sometimes. And the last one, in the triad of optic tract syndrome, on which side of the RA, which side is the RAPD observed? Ipsilateral to lesion or, or contralateral to lesion? So um, the reason why we don't see optic atrophy on exam and lesions 
in optic radiations is that it's posterior to the LGN, so that's second order neurons, and we don't have that um, optic atrophy. The uh, type of lesion that we, or defect that we usually see on visual fields with optic tract lesions are incongruous, contralateral homonymous hemiopias. Um, and then fibers from the right eye of parvocellular ganglion cells will terminate on the left LG, that terminate on the left LGN, um, correspond to uh, one, four, and six, because the ipsilateral eye corresponds to prime numbers in a row, so that's two, three, and five. Um, and the last one, uh, in the optic tract syndrome, we usually see the RAPD on the contralateral side of the region, re, uh, lesion because the majority of fibers in the optic tract are decussated fibers that are, na that are nasal. Okay, any questions? Good morning, sorry I'm late, guys. We uh, had to do an LPI bilaterally on a bilateral angle closure. So apologize. Um, last but not least, in our afferent pathway, we are finally back to the cortex, primary visual cortex, where we're um, going to end kind of our journey this morning. Um, so following the lateral geniculate nucleus, our tracks come backwards, as Sarov said, both through the temporal lobe and through the parietal lobe to get back to our primary visual cortex. The center of the primary visual cortex is uh, known as Brodmann area 17, or the striate cortex. Um, and it lies back here, kind of straddling the Calcarin fissure right in the back of the occipital lobe. Um, and that's where all of our fibers will come from the optic tract and terminate here. Um, kind of as Strav had alluded to, our inferior fibers will travel anterior first and then lateral all the way around the temporal horn to end up back in our calcarine fissure here. And like she had said, our superior fibers will come posteriorly through the parietal lobe and end up again back in the calcarine fissure here. Um, as a reminder, our fibers in the superior retinal quadrants will end up in the inferior visual fields, or it, of the inferior visual field will end up superiorly and the, con the contrary is true for the inferior retinal quadrants or the superior visual field. And through all of this, we maintain a retinotropic distribution, meaning that kind of visual field pattern is maintained onto the cortex. Um, really importantly to uh, remember here, the cortex is very much weighted around the macula. 60% um, of the cortex is focused on the first uh, central 10 degrees of the macula. Um, and then actually 80% of the cortex is focused around uh, the actual central 30 degrees. So we're very uh, macular heavy in terms of, of the cortex here. Um, the superior cortex, again, receives information from the inferior visual field and we maintain that retinotropic distribution, um, which I didn't really know what that meant or I had a hard time kind of understanding what that meant, but that just means that the pattern that you see um, in a retinal visual field is maintained all the way back to the cortex in terms of how we are interpreting that visual information coming to the central uh, part of the brain in the occipital lobe. Uh, these areas are important to know. So like I said, we have the Brodmann area, which is our primary visual cortex, but then we have uh, V2 through V5, which are also these other more complicated, higher visual functioning cortex regions uh, that I had seen come up in questions before. Um, all of the information will come back here to V1 and then kind of demonstrate forward to these other areas, V2 through V5, for higher uh, cortical visual interpretation. Um, in terms of uh, V3, in V2, we consider these to be contiguous with V1, meaning that this information kind of directly passed to both of those. Um, V4 and V5 are important to remember um, because V4 is uh, the area that's sensitive to kind of our interpretation of color. Um, and along with that, we consider this to be the area of our interpretation of the what. What are we seeing? What are we interpreting? Um, and that V4 it, um, is down below, I just remember it in order, so V4 kind of lower and V5 up above. Um, cerebral achromatopsia is basically where we uh, aren't able to discern color at all. Patients will describe lesions in this area as seeing the world as dull. They don't see any sort of discernment between color, they will just see various shades of gray. Um, and, and that means that we've hit somewhere along this 
pathway from V1 to V4 or the V4 region itself. Um, V5 is important to note up there in the superior temporal sulcus um, that this is what we, where we sort of discern information in terms of where. So movement and direction of objects, um, things coming at you, being able to discern between stationary and non-stationary, um, and where spatially, visual spatially, um, that information is, is all kind of here in the V5 area in terms of higher cortical function. Um, so then, kind of focusing on occipital lobe lesions themselves, um, we talk about lesions in the occipital lobe as being either macular sparing or macular involving, depending on how the occipital lobe is being um, actually affected by the lesion. So, how, why do we get this macular sparing versus non-macular sparing phenomenon? Uh, most people will agree that there is kind of dual innervation of the occipital lobe that allows for this phenomenon. Uh, the posterior cerebral artery provides the majority of the blood flow to the occipital lobe. However, there is a small branch of the middle cerebral artery which reaches all the way back and provides some dual supply for the central part of the occipital lobe. Therefore, if you take out your posterior cerebral artery, but the middle cerebral artery is maintained, you'll have a, a homonymous defect that will actually spare the macula, usually between five and 10 degrees centrally, because that middle cerebral artery is still intact, providing that central macula um, with some blood flow. If you have a situation where you have sort of global ischemia, an anoxic brain injury, something like that, that hits everything, then certainly we wouldn't expect to see any sort of macular sparing lesion in the cortex. Um, and then briefly going to cortical blindness. Um, if we're hitting the occipital lobe, I think cortical blindness can be a really interesting phenomenon. Um, in terms of acquired cortical blindness that we see in patients uh, who were born with normal cortical function, as far as we know, anoxic brain injury is the most common kind of global injury to this area. Traumatic brain injuries, particularly those that uh, affect the occipital lobe directly. Um, eclampsia and rarely preeclampsia can also cause these phenomena, CJD um, and infection. And then I also was reading about um, anti-epileptic drugs and there are a variety of anti-epileptic drugs that will create sort of a uh, intermittent or non-permanent uh, cortical blindness that can be acquired and if you stop the AED it can actually resolve. Um, in terms of congenital causes of cortical blindness, so traumatic brain injury, um, birth trauma, occipital lobe malformation, so congenital lesions that way, uh, perinatal ischemia, again, these sort of global ischemic events hitting the occipital lobe, and then meningitis and encephalitis in our newborns can also cause uh, cortical blindness that is irreversible and kind of congenital for, right from birth. Um, two phenomena to know with cortical blindness, so Anton Babinski syndrome um, and Redox syndrome. Uh, Anton Babinski syndrome is where we basically have a patient who's cortically blind, but they are in denial of that loss of visual interpretation. So they will tell you, yes, my vision's fine. I have no difficulty um, with, with any sort of vision loss. Why are you asking me that? So that's Anton Babinski syndrome. And then Riddock syndrome is actually where uh, the patient will kind of run into objects because they're not really aware of their lack of visual spatial information coming into them. Uh, so both of these are common with cortical blindness. Um, with all of our occipital lobe lesions and cortical injuries, um, patients in their absent visual fields will often have uh, other light phenomena and visual phenomena in those fields, so commonly complaining of circular lights or other things as the brain's trying to uh, come up with information in those areas that are absent. Um, I also read a few studies where if uh, patients had recently had, say, a stroke or some sort of ischemic injury to an area and they did have some scintillating um, imagery or visual uh, affects in that area, that that sometimes was an indicative uh, kind of sign that they may actually get some of that vision back, um, side, kind of demonstrating that the retina was trying to still kind of fire away at the cortex and, and keep that imaging going. Um, I remember these two phenomenon because I remember that Anton, for some reason, he's in denial. And then Riddock somehow sounds like a sound that I would make if I ran into something. So like, oh, Riddock. Yes. <laughs> so I don't know if that's helpful. But. <laughs>
Um, so that was kind of the majority of the cortex. Um, it's really important to remember those V1 through V4 areas. Um, and then uh, our macular sparing lesions, why we may or may not have macular sparing vision, um, and then kind of phenomenon that can create and represent cortical blindness. Can I just say something about Reduck? Yeah. Um, so Re George Reduck was a World War I physician who was in the trenches uh, and, um, and saw soldiers whose occipital lobes had been damaged in the war. And, uh, but so Redux syndrome is, like you say, uh, the person runs into objects, stationary objects, but what's really peculiar is that anything moving they can see. So uh, they can, if you, if you were to lift up something and move it, then they can see it. But if it's stationary or just static, they can't. So it's a kind of a uh, dissociation be some, between something moving and something stationary. Questions. Yeah, sorry, these were just actually yeah. these two over here. Oh, okay. What? Oh, did mine not? Well, I have three questions on the computer. Maybe this wasn't the most up to date one. Um, but that's okay. Do you want me to just? I think I can remember them. Um, I don't know if that's helpful. Maybe not. But I suppose so. My first question was just: um, Is it? So if you have, you take out your PCA on the right-hand side, <coughs> where and what do you expect to see in terms of your lesion? So you would expect to see a contralateral homonymous defect that would be macular sparing, um, given that your posterior cervical artery was compromised, but your MCA, you would assume, would be still intact unless there was a global change injury. Um, I think I did a true or false on areas four and five. Do you guys remember area four and area five? Where and what? Perfect. Color vision is where? 